my first rule is you can't do anything on your own. So this is a particularly trying period for if you think as I do. And, um, and Pauline's right, after an initial sort of five, six weeks of solidarity where there was a recognition of the importance of workers. Do you remember that? When we respected workers and we used to clap truck drivers and NHS workers and, you know, new definition of working class, something you couldn't do from home, you know, and, you know, a recognition of the people who, who went out, that all just has been dissipated, as Pauline rightly said, as that general sense of, of solidarity that people felt. And, um, and, and so what I'd really like to do is just talk about, you know, the way that the virus has intensified things and as part of a longer term trend. So my view is essentially what we've been dealing with for the past 40 years, probably longer, is the increasing disintegration of society as two fundamental institutions and processes disintegrate it. Um, one is the market. So I just want to talk about that for a moment. Um, the penetration of, of market relations and it's, it's gone six o'clock. So I'm going to use this word, but I always apologize for using it because it's really ugly, but I can't find a replacement, which is commodification. That's the turning of things that weren't produced for sale, like human beings and nature, into something that's available at a price in fluctuating markets. And fundamental part of the story is the things that we used to do together, increasingly we buy. So that's one of the stories is the power of the market, but obviously that's unsustainable as a form of life. So then the things that we used to do together then get nationalized by the state. So then you've got the state, which turns us into administrative units essentially and all of that undermines any sense of democracy, any sense of association. And um, so I'm very much uh, running into the fund, you know, so globalization as a theory was just this combination of the market and then the administrative regulative state. And it rendered, rendered us really powerless to affect the, the rate of change and the direction of change. So, you know, that's just a very brief bit of theoretical um, waffling going on. Just to highlight that the breakdown of association, the priority of processes, the concentration, the way that capital itself centralizes every bit as much as the state. So those of us of a certain age can remember building societies, you know, that were rooted in the places that they were in, you know, places like the Halifax or you know, does anybody remember Northern Rock, you know, that was based in Newcastle? And these were forms of mutual association through which people shared um, the burdens and the benefits of association. Uh, they've all gone, all the um, demutualized building societies have disintegrated, all the banks have centralized. So there's been a denuding of assets um, from places. Um, concentrated in the in the city of city of London and then this concentration of the state so in my waking nightmare that we're living through all I see really as the two institutions that are surviving are, are the treasury and the NHS you know debt and NHS that's it that's what we're living on at the moment um very much the subordination um of society to the market and, and then the state. And while there was a kind of glimpse of some, of some hope, I thought, in relation to a recognized recognition of the importance of place of the working class of the nation state as something other than an administrative unit, what you've really seen during COVID is, is an intensification of the, other, of the other trend towards the isolation, the internet, the undermining of place, um, you know, China and the internet oligarchs. I mean, last Friday, just to let you know, Jeff Bezos made eight billion pounds last Friday. You know, that's a, a real, and the decimation of small businesses, of restaurants, um, and, and the consolidation of those, of those oligarchs. And you can see the confusion going on. Um, 
So the church, for example, is a good place to under, understand that. Essentially, prayer has been privatized. You can only go into a church for private prayer. There's no sense of a communion of, of any sense of prayer, no matter how well the safeguards uh, are enforced. And then the pressure on the church to be a welfare agency. So those two things, you know, privatization of prayer and welfare. But the idea of an associate body, of a corporate body, is disintegrating essentially. And so what we've seen is a, a politics of sort of mutual demonization um, going on. And you can see in the American election just how horrendous the direction of travel is. So what I want to talk about is how do we respond to that? And how do we actually talk about the truth that we need to talk about, which is how do we associate? How do we build um, a local politics um, with each other and that's built, built I think on the primacy of relationships and building relationships between estranged groups is is the vital way ahead and what I found in my experience with all that is you know I worked on living wage on you know the anti-usury campaign there's stuff around housing uh, land reform because what's going to go on is that the state and the market will assert their power here. People will be, you know, evicted from their homes, people who can't pay their rent. So it's vital to think about what we need to do to strengthen local places. So I'm very much in favour of campaigning for the endowment of local banks, so a transfer of assets to places so people can do things together. Um, vocational colleges, um, things like that, representation of workers on boards is, but above all to put relationships first, and that's very hard to do at this time, but I think it's vital uh, that we think about that and, and about the redistribution of power to places through those assets and, um, and, and through that investment. So one of the things that I say sometimes is that it's the opposite of what my mum taught me, is that only where there's a way is that a will. So I'd, I'd like to think of this time as a time of reflection that we can have together on conceptualising what, where do we want to live, you know, beginning with the place that we live in, what are the institutions that need reviving or creating that can give meaning and purpose to people, because the, the threat to human existence as social beings is very real at the moment. And through through isolation, through marginalisation, um, so those those are the concerns that I have. As you can hear, I could probably go on talking for a very long time, so I'll just stop there. But any questions you've got? Um, okay, so um, there's all sorts of things Morris said there that I now want to respond to, but I'll hold myself in oh. um, because Pauline asked me. Um, could we use collective voluntary action to build a better society? And I suppose as somebody who's been quite good in a very local way at getting folks together and making stuff happen, I think we can. Um, so I feel quite hopeful about that. But I think there are some conditions and I'm fairly strong on those conditions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my history um, and how come I do this stuff? How come I bring people together to make things happen? I'm going to talk a little bit about rage and what fuels my doing that. Um, and it is mostly rage. Um, and then perhaps talk a little bit about how voluntary action fits in to an economy um, because they are different and sometimes the same things. Um, so first, how did I get to here? Well, I probably learnt my trade at Greenham Common and in the squats of um, oval mansions in Vauxhall in 80s London when nobody wanted to live there and there were empty houses. Um, and, and, and particularly for my father, who I grew up in a small market town, um, which was failing. Um, suicides were through the roof because hill farmers could no longer make ends meet or support their families. And so rather than face the indignity of being a man who couldn't provide for their family, farmers killed themselves. And that was pretty shocking to a young lass. Um, and what my dad did with that was he held a carnival and a pageant. He set up a museum and a steam railway. Um, and by inviting everybody from the WI to the Scouts group to have a stall at the local 
pageant um, that happened down the marketplace, he found a role for everybody and gave them something to do. Um, and slowly, uh, the place is called Pickering in North Yorkshire, and it's one of the most visited tourist places now in North Yorkshire. He built a tourist industry, along with many others who helped him to do that, not all the credit to be dad. Um, but uh, I think that, that having done that, I then I went off to university and did my thing and found myself in Sheffield um, just after all the people in the steelworks had lost their jobs very suddenly, unlike say Liverpool where jobs were lost slowly, it happened really rapidly in Sheffield and I was based out on the Manor Estate. Um, and Band-Aid happened, this big charitable event with Bob Geldof telling us all to give, give, give. And actually the people I was with on Manor Estate gave 25% of their income to Band-Aid because most people were on the dole, or not because most people were on the dole, people were on the dole, and that's how much it added up to. And, you know, I'd come from fancy London and my university education, and nobody outside of Sheffield that I knew was giving anywhere near 25% of their income. And so that inequality of generosity began to strike home to me about who gives and who doesn't give when we're asked to do things voluntarily. Um, and similarly, when I look at my mum, um, I'm one of that first generation, knocking on for 60 now, that was allowed a job and children. I didn't have to choose. I wanted it all and I took it all. But in reality, I still do. Um, well, women like me, not me. I've got a, a husband who pulls his weight. But we still do 80% of the unpaid work. And so I think it is worth questioning ourselves as to when things are voluntary, and when we're just talking about unpaid work that some people bear the brunt of and others don't. Um, so then I come on to rage and where my rage fuels things and everything I've been involved in, whether it's uh, Granby Four Streets or um, Baltic Creative or everything really, everything I've been involved in where real stuff has been achieved by ordinary people and they've got shit done has been fueled by rage. Um, in, in, in Baltic Creative, it was a woman called Jane Casey, who was so incensed that the biennial would not show local artists, that she put on a show down in that area of the city where there was loads of un, unused property. And we all got to go into that property for the first time and imagine what could happen there. Oh, if only we had this space what could we do? Um, and she was, she was also, as we all were, enraged by that constant displacement of artists who went into an area, created value, and then got moved on. And so we got some ownership in Baltic and created now what I believe is the biggest community interest company, asset owning community interest country in the company in the country, which we're really proud of. Same with Granby Four Streets, a friend of mine, Eleanor Lee was so enraged that actually people had been living in a shit hole for 30 years that she picked up a brush and began to sweep the street and others joined in. And then she dragged me down of a Saturday and we began to paint tinned up sheets on houses because it looked better if they were white than if they had gas off sprayed on them in this abusive kind of way. Um, and probably my rage was fueled by a Somali woman who actually had strapped her child to her and traveled under a train to get to this country, and yet was expected to walk down a street with no street lights, where she was one of about six people who lived on a street built for 80, in fear. Um, and yet she'd left Somalia to get away from rape, and she lived in fear in this country, and I was ashamed of that. Um, and then I turned to the helped and the helpers, and who um, Pauline referred to that 750,000 volunteer responders. And in Liverpool on the first day, Liverpool, the city mayor called for people to volunteer and 700 in a day volunteered, but only 24 people wanted help. And there is something about how we all want to be helpers, but some of us are consigned to being the receivers of that help. 
and, and Liverpool particularly, you know, it's, it, it's very identity became, it absorbed the identity of being the poorest within a whole hierarchy of need. And by being the worst in the class, it got the most. And what that does to our sense of identity and belief is a very negative cycle, I think, that I think has been very destructive to economies and their confidence and our ability to rebuild them. Um, one so finally, just, yeah, 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 just to turn to the economy, the shape of the economy. Um, so I understand the economy not as a triangle, not as a hierarchy, but as a honeycomb. And I had the pleasure during lockdown of joining some of the mutual aid calls and realised that there's people like me in the communities I work with, a myriad of us up and down the country. I think the best quote I heard on those calls was that, the economy that we had come to rely on didn't even have three months resilience within it. And actually the people who had resilience were the small entrepreneurs, community activists and social organisations who, who built that honeycomb during lockdown. And so I think that honeycomb is possible. It is possible to harness that for something else, but you can't stick a triangle on top of it because the honey gets squeezed out and the bees get killed. Um, and so if we want to imagine a better economy, we have to imagine it in a more equitable way in which we are connected to each other on many sides and through many shapes and it can't be controlled and managed through a central force or a top-down organization it has to be something we share between us thanks erica thank you very much for that um i'll ask um william hi hi yeah, would you like to to to, uh, to start, William? Great, thanks. Uh, first, thanks, uh, kind of you to invite me. Um, thank you. Um, my father's from Liverpool, and I have wonderful memories as a child, um, knocking around Mossley Hill, and also the city centre, but also um, Anfield. And I thought, as a young child, that Tommy Smith, Ian Callaghan, Phil Lawler, Keegan, and Tosha, I thought that was normal. Turns out it was special. <laughs> anyway, um, I'd like to talk about uh, our experience up here in Northumberland um, in Corbridge during this pandemic. I, um, I chair uh, a community council, there are about 4,000 souls within it. And we have quite high, we're strong civic society here, lots of groups, lots of participation. Uh, but when the pandemic came along, um, our main preoccupation was to look at where people might fall through the net because obviously you've got nhs care and social services and so on primary care but um there was actually a need for people to to run things you know and actually if you lock people in their homes um particularly people that need prescriptions and food you need people to run it so what we did was we convened with the churches and traders and a lot of other people I got people together, it's like a little sort of mini sage or whatever, and um, we divided Corbridge into six sectors and convened volunteers basically through the, through the magazine. And we were overwhelmed. I mean, I had more volunteers in each sector than I could do with. You know, literally people ring up and saying, what can I do? And I, I'd say, well, you know, we're okay in that area. Uh, I, I reckon we had about six times as many uh, as much capacity through volunteers as we needed, which was very encouraging. Um, so, I mean, it proved the, the were gaps and we did fill them. So that was successful. But I just want to talk about the lessons. Um, I mean, the first lesson is that if the conditions are right, the, the sort of latent uh, impulse to want to volunteer and contribute is huge. But I think you have to remember, as Morris said, that the conditions at the start were really quite unusual. Uh, and certainly in my lifetime, certainly exceptional, never seen anything like it. Um, and I think to some extent, the huge impulse we has, had at that stage was contingent on the conditions. And since then, certainly nationally, the level of solidarity that we convened in March, April has, has faded. And I think it's as well to, to, to look at the reasons for that. And I, I, I'm just gonna mention four things. First, time itself, 
um, people actually just grow weary. I mean, people accept a, a three week idea of a lockdown, which became seven and so on. Then it started to affect everything else. So people have just become weary. Um, secondly, there's a sense in which as the lockdown is a, a sort of draconian measure, that that's crowded out some of the sort of voluntary personal responsibility, um, sort of grassroots up aspects of it. So the more the government's actions have been seen as, as harsh and draconian, uh, I think that's slightly crowded out the voluntary impulse. Um, thirdly, I think um, one of the things that's, that's borne down on people is that the collateral damage of the lockdowns and the pandemic itself has borne through. I think in the very, very early stages, you just didn't see that as much. I mean, people hadn't lost their jobs. People weren't not getting treated for cancer and other things. So the, the further we've gone down the line, the more that's, that's uh, asserted itself. And also the sense that the cost of this hasn't been borne uh, evenly. That's evident. Some people have been pretty well protected and have had quite a good lockdown. Um, and finally, I think a final consequence um, is that the sort of social ecosystem itself has started to fray a little. I mean, we let a community hall in Corbridge, and as I say, we've got about 35 groups to use it. I am not confident, I think we'll lose some permanently just because of the gap. I think some groups have, have sort of, you know, um, have, have disassembled, if you like, and I think that's the cost of it. Uh, just finally, looking forward, um, I, I agree in the preamble, I think a sort of top down, I mean, state intervention, st there's not, there's, states are very, very powerful, but the, the top down centralized sort of Whitehall approach, I think has been found wanting uh, and has been less resilient in some areas, certainly test, trace, isolate, probably would have been better done locally, I think. Um, and it's also proved if you're sort of prone to the problem of, of singular failure. I think if you have one state policy and it's over the whole state and it goes wrong, you're really in trouble. If you have lots of different approaches, slightly more resilient. Um, just to finish, I just want to um, talk about the fact that the, I mean, as Morris indicated, the, the, the pandemic has been very good for big tech and big business, very good for Amazon, very good for people uh, providing platforms to do what we're doing now. And all of this is very alarming because the, the long-term trend in organizations uh, has been fewer but larger units and more powerful units. And that's, 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 that concentrates power into very, very few players. I think is, is quite dangerous going forward. Um, everyone acknowledges that, that community action depends on, on um, community activism and therefore people. But I just wanna finish by making a plea for the importance of, of, of community architecture physical architecture. What I mean by that is literally the pubs, the playing facilities, the community centers, cricket clubs, churches, libraries, and everything like that. That is your community architecture. And I think if you're going to convene people, you need somewhere physical to convene. And the physicality of it is very important because if we don't keep that, human beings face a future which is basically on screens, which I think would be dreadful. So that's me done. Thank you. Thanks very much, William. And actually, just to point on that point of the architecture, we are actually having a Liverpool Sound discussion on the 30th of November about architecture and planning. So oh. you may want to come back to that. Um, I'm now going to ask uh, Dave Clements if he would speak. Uh, yeah. Yes. Dave, great. Thank, thank you very much, Pauline. Um, back in 2008, I uh, co edited a book. With Austin Williams, Alistair Donald, and Martin Earnshaw. Um, we called it The Future of Community. It was subtitled Reports of a Death Greatly Exaggerated. Uh, the book was supposed to be a challenge to the, the social pessimism of the time, but also a, um, a counter to the idea that the state knows best. It was a set of essays arguing for community. I contributed a couple of essays arguing against what I called the uh, faking of community. And asking whether fa asking whether fashionable arguments uh, in favour of localism were all the cracked up be a point I'll, I'll try and make again. But the important point for now is that today I think lockdown uh, really does feel like the death of community, at least until we let back out again. Back in March, when we entered into what we were told would be uh, temporary hibernation, 
community was arguably thriving uh, as neighbors set up mutual aid groups almost overnight using platforms like uh, WhatsApp and volunteered in large numbers for centrally uh, and locally run schemes. But even then, I think there was something that wasn't well. Uh, some people uh, were not so much looking at each other as spying or snitching on each other. Uh, we're out of fear of the virus, um, out of the mutual suspicion that fostered over recent decades, uh, or as a consequence of using atomization, dating back even further. Uh, social solidarity has been under a lot of strain. The voluntarism and the altruism that we saw early on in the crisis and that Erica um, uh, was speaking about has since, uh, I agree uh, with what William said, been crowded out by state action and by increasingly authoritarian interventions that have made it difficult for people to act in a pro-social way or even to care for members. Of I think we're effectively under house arrest or uh, as the uh, Prime Minister uh, has put it, um, the state is putting its arm around us. Um, it, it feels uh, less like a cuddle, uh, more occasion, I think, at the moment. So it's perhaps worth reminding ourselves what it was like just four years ago, uh, the battle for Brexit following the national debate in 2016 before the referendum was a great mobiliser of popular engagement with politics, uh, of organising protests and debates and ensuring through arguments and through activism that the vote to leave the EU was finally honoured. I think up until that point, the orthodox view was that the people were apathetic. Um, they wouldn't turn out to vote and needed educating in how to be good citizens and how to get involved. But the experience of battling over a principle that, affect, that affected all of our lives and that notion that we were taking back control animated people like never before in, in living memory. Indeed, policymakers uh, seemed a lot less interested in, in, in engaging us uh, at this point. We certainly weren't apathetic anymore. There was a new spark, I think, uh, but it was quickly snuffed out by the government's response to COVID. And this in itself suggests that the foundations of that popular revolt were a good deal shakier than we imagined. There's been a significant undermining of the robustness of the individual. I think we have a degraded sense of ourselves as political subjects and as citizens or rational agents able to grapple with an impact upon the situation we find ourselves in. This has contributed, I think, to a dysfunctional relationship between the state, individuals, and the communities of which we're all part. A dysfunctional relationship that pre-exists by a long way, the COVID crisis, and the stop-start locking down of society that we are now experiencing. I think that Boris thinks we need a hug rather than an immediate end to the lockdown, restoration of our liberties, and an opportunity to get on with our lives, illustrates the problem. And yet, there is growing opposition or be opposition to a vocal, um, by a vocal minority of academics, medics, journalists, politicians, and newly emerging groups, much of it necessarily online. There is increasing hostility, not just to the lockdown, but to some of the more regressive trends that it has brought to the surface. Groups like uh, Unlocked and Save Our Statues, the Free Speech Union, Us For Them, the Reform Party and Reclaim have emerged in recent months. Many of these groups, with the notable, notable exception of the FDP and Blue Labour, are on the right. I think it's striking that those who once saw their job as being all about representing the working class and resisting tyranny are no longer interested in seeking common cause with the common man and woman or in defending their liberties. They're more likely to berate people for their unconscious racism and white privilege or to agitate for harder, longer, earlier lockdowns that can only impoverish those who can't work at home. So what calls itself the left now stands in opposition to ordinary people and their communities. Start where we left off with the leftish case for Brexit. And this is the point I made back in 2008, get beyond um, grow your own and make do and mend localism. We need global citizens, not in the sense of the so-called citizens of nowhere, but in that expansive, all be bounded sense of people believing once more that they can change the world. Now, that, that might seem like a big ask when we can't even leave our own homes at the moment uh, to associate in public or in, even in private. But this experience, if nothing else, alert us to what really matters. First Brexit and now COVID should remind us that the discussion about citizenship and community isn't some abstract thing. It's not just an academic discussion. 
it's as essential as an essential worker, you might say. It's a real living question that impinges directly upon our lives and the kind of society we want to live in. We need to argue once again for the importance of community and challenge the interventions of the state. Uh, Morris talked about the subordination of society to the market and the state. And I think state interventions can be overbearing at best and counterproductive at first. And yes, we need big state interventions in the, in the economy uh, now more than ever and at every level. And yes, bureaucrats, furloughs and free school meals all, all have their place. But when it comes to rebuilding our communities and creating a better society, we need a minimal state, not an expansive one. One that leaves most of us alone most of the time, not one that's trying to squeeze the life out of us. I think that way we can organise and do what needs doing ourselves. I don't share the view of some lockdown sceptics that ordinary people have no backbone, that they are sheep or bedwetters, to use the language adopted by some on Twitter, for complying with COVID rules and being too obedient. We need a culture of debate to win people over. We should be encouraged, though, I think, by those challenging the restrictions we face and standing up against some of the more destructive trends in today's political culture. Likewise, we should be encouraged by protesters in central London on the eve of lockdown two, resisting arrest and students tearing down the fences that were enclosing them at Manchester Metropolitan University. They need to get together with the lockdown, lockdown of Liverpool and beyond and call for wider solidarity. I think that, um, to conclude, would be my call to action. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. And our final speaker is Ronnie, Ronnie Hughes. Hi, Ronnie. Hi, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Okay. I thought I'd start with a few thoughts, disagreements, really, about how our discussions being framed in the preamble, but mainly in the advert for this, um, particularly from a Liverpool point of view, which you'd kind of expect. And first about the weakness of centralised authority. Actually, I think the sense is too strong. Powers have been increasingly taken from localised to central authorities over the last 40 years. So now local authorities like Liverpool are forced to act increasingly as the client bodies of the centre. Clients with lip service devolutions and placemen theirs, but clearly clients. Next, the contract between citizens of the state it's at least arguable whether there is a contract with a punitive state ruling by frequent diktats, bypassing parliament and so much not working. Homelessness, dependence on food banks, punitive benefits, useless and corrupt responses to COVID. I could go on. All contracts, I'd say, require mutual trust and respect. And is there much of that left? I don't think so. Then there's this mobilising of collective responses that we've mainly spoken about tonight. I'm not surprised the initial public response to COVID was good. It's instinctive to care and people were initially prepared to put aside all I've just said and get on with caring. But poor leadership, corruption and Dominic Cummings lost our trust. And anyway, mobilising collective responses sounds a bit like some old style marshalling of the obedient citizenry of a Marxist state. And I think society is more complex than that. So for good society then, for a start, a good society in any nation would be made up of hundreds or even thousands of societies in all of our places, the kind of places where I'll speak about in a minute. Though even places aren't what they used to be. We're multi, not monocultures mono now. Homogenization is thankfully over. So any plan to make or even think of a good society has to start with these thousands of locals because no one lives in the imagined community that is a nation or what we might call its society. We live where we are, we live with who we live with, and even there, we don't all see our places the same way. So that's complex too. And so to the local. My PhD is about the local, particular cases of the possible, I'm currently calling it. Arriving here via lots of local sorts of work, and also utopianism, socialism, and very, very long ago, Catholicism. And each of these last three have good things about them, but also tendencies to be big systems of single solutions that don't work for many of us, and certainly not for me anymore. Big centralised things they were, forever telling their regions, that's us lot, what, what to do. More of that mobilising of collective responsibility responses then which people don't always like and won't always put up with. 
Whereas, this is my central bit, I suppose, the best responses to many and various current situations I've seen over recent decades have all been by locals, calling themselves all sorts of community things and enterprise things, but doing things for themselves, often with little help, no commissions, and in spite of whatever powers might surround or ignore them. I could list them, and Eric has mentioned some of them, and tell you about the pickaxes. Ellen Ring Granby had a pickaxe as well as a brush. Trowels, bikes, bread ovens and washing machines that they used to start changing their local worlds. I could also mention how between the lot of them in and around Liverpool, they've collectively responded and continue to respond to our hunger, health, continuance of life and common humanity COVID needs, as well as anybody and better than most. That good, that essential, and no one called them to action except for themselves because of their love and concern for their places and for each other. Not that complex then. So a good society, I'm edging towards saying, and if such a thing is to be possible, will build from the local or it won't build at all. Certainly not from calls to action, another old style we know best mobilizations. Neither in finishing do I have a big system solution to finish with. My PhD is definitely not looking for the utopia that comes next after utopia and those others. Instead, just a few things to do and to think about. First, about how we begin reversing the continual centralizing of the last 40 years so that real powers of control, enablement and taxation are returned to local authorities before they take those powers anyway, encouraged by the limited devolutions that have seen Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland cope differently and better with COVID. So that when actual locals have ideas and start delivering them, the local authorities have more abilities and resources to support them. Knowing that they in their turn, and are you listening Liverpool City, need to reverse their own tendencies to centralised boss politics and know when to get out of the locals way. And so building our trust over time that people will do good things because we do. And so we can also start to reduce the society's tendency to rely on charities to fill in for its own lack of common caring and decency. And so that maybe, and over time, local by local, we might be able to decide what would make a good society and how and whether we're getting there. Because a good society, or at least a better one, will build from the local or it won't build at all. That's me long. Thanks very much. Thank you.